take an opportunity. Let me uh, proceed and, and do a quick introduction, if I may. Walid Al Safiq is an associate professor and senior lecturer in journalism and media technology. Uh, and I'm not sure on how to pronounce this university with the umlauts or, or the two accents. Is that Sodaton? Uh, Sodaton. Yes. Oh, okay. Sodaton. Sodaton. University in Stockholm, where his interests revolve around the intersection of journalism and technology, including blockchain, artificial intelligence, robotics, and big data. He is originally from Yemen and has served on the ISOC board as a trustee during 2014 and 2021. And I had the pleasure of at least three years working with Walid as a, on the board. So welcome to our session and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you indeed, Glenn. Uh, thank you, Alfredo. And uh, it's really a great honor to be part of the school. I've been uh, really impressed by the work that you've been doing. So keep it up. Thank you. And so uh, you can tell from the title that it's going to be a bit of a broad, you know, a broad subject, blockchain, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies a primer and a use case. So I ex meant, meant to show here that there is an overarching view of the field uh, through this presentation, but there's also a possibility to look into a single use case. There's not much time to go through more, uh, but that is a use case that I have been researching quite a lot recently. It's in the field of journalism and fake news. But I'll uh, presume, uh, presume that you'll have questions. So feel free as uh, Glenn mentioned to ask. So uh, let me begin with a, a, couple, a couple of quotes. Uh, there was a quote of saying, of saying, visionaries see a future of telecommuting workers, interactive libraries, and multimedia classrooms. They speak of electronic town meetings and virtual communities. Commerce and business will shift from offices and malls to networks and modems. We are, prom we are promised instant catalog shopping, just point and click for great deals. We'll order airline tickets over the network, make restaurant reservations, and negotiate sales contracts. We'll soon buy books and newspapers straight over the internet. And then, oh, sure. So this was purely a, 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 ridicule, a ridiculing of the internet's promise. And it was given by um, actually a scientist, an astronomer, Clifford Stoll. This was 1995, so you can, you know, in some ways, you can um, let it pass since it was some long time ago. However, this is then when he published about this in a more of a, let's say, dismissive tone, such as this article that you had published on uh, in, in the New Newsweek in 95, the internet there, and so the idea here is that. This at the time was a simple representation of one perspective of society. They have been seen as the critics, the skeptics, which is fine, which is perfectly good as well. And it also reflects on the need to be humble and not realizing what would happen next, which is this. After many years, he came back and saying, I think back to uh, some of my own cringeworthy contributions, now, whenever I think I know what's happening, I temper my thoughts. Might be wrong, Cliff. And so this is basically an illustration of new technologies. And I like the title, Emergent Technologies, is something that we really don't have a full grasp of. We cannot really say for certain if it will fail, like this assertion on the internet, or we cannot also equally say it will succeed and totally transform the world. That's why the first thing I'd like to start with is to always be humble, appreciate the fact that we don't know how things would roll out. We are looking into something that is emerging. And so we can't even say that this is going to be totally disruptive yet. There will be signs for that. And so with that in mind, I'd like to hope that everyone now understands that I am not, a, let's say, a more of a maximalist of the technology even though some might look into uh, at me and say that, but uh, I am someone who thinks that any emerging technology should be looked at, should be considered, should be experimented with, and should never be dismissed. Nothing should be dismissed uh, out of the bat. There's always something to 
study and uh, pursue further. And so let us take a step back and go back to the internet itself and communication at large. And so you can see these uh, ancient uh, artifacts. I don't know if uh, you've seen, there's a video of uh, kids looking at the regular mobile, old mobile phones, and they are puzzled by how primitive they look. And so this is basically even a major leap compared to what used to be in the past, in the telex or and the uh, regular operated uh, phones, as well as the telefax. All of these have become obsolete to some extent because of the internet. And even the internet itself uh, is a way, way, way uh, uh, fast in its accelerated uh, rate in terms of development. Because if you look at the right side, this is one of the oldest web pages archived in 96 by Yahoo, of, of, of Yahoo. And you can tell that it was extremely, extremely primitive at the time. It has now advanced tremendously in remarkable ways. And the reason for this development is for because of need to for a betterment. So the more you improve technologies, the more they result in greater uh, adapt, adoption and the spread, the widely spread they become. And so you can tell here, for example, efficiency, speed, versatility, reliability and durability, robustness, accessibility. And so these are the key words that you would always weigh technologies with. And global reach, for example, in which we talk about a lot uh, as well, and we used to talk about that at ISO. And so uh, usability with, in terms of ease of access. So you can tell internet has developed over time because these attributes have been developed. It's not because the technology itself has changed, but it has become more or less much more uh, aware of the need for uh, meeting the needs of uh, the society. And for that, uh, you can tell that uh, blockchain, as I'll explain later, is far, far behind when it comes to these characteristics, but it's on its way. So if you notice uh, one thing about the internet, which Manuel Castells calls the message, and uh, he's taking the adapting the phrase of uh, Marshall McLuhan on the media is the message, saying the way that the internet is composed dictates how it will operate, how it will, might change society. So the very fact that the internet is global, it's reachable across the world, and it's open, the infrastructure is open source, so you can actually literally uh, create an internet out of uh, nowhere if, if you take uh, the code and you take the bits and pieces of it and go to some island, you can create a mini internet. And the third thing is that it is built on the concept of decentralization. To sort of, of say this is basically a revolution compared to the traditional method of communication through operators. I know many of you are already experts in this, so I don't want to preach, uh, preach to you. Uh, they are already believers in this. But uh, I thought of bringing these concepts to show us where the internet has been. So I, I coincidentally, this looks <laughs> like it reminds me of something, right? Just, I use it as a joke more or less, but it's, it's very much difficult to destroy and it is possible to replicate and it regenerates. If you destroy one part, it can regenerate it again. And the way it is reached through uh, science and through open source is really a major factor behind its development. And so let us take a step to uh, back to the very, very essential way in which the internet works. So the internet for email relies on peer-to-peer -peer communications through nodes. And so you have an email device, a client, for example, like a mobile phone. And so this mobile phone can be actually interacting through a network of nodes to reach at the other end, whether it's a computer, a server, or another mobile phone. So this allows email to be sent peer to peer in a way that does not require a central entity. A central entity meaning that there would always be, if there is an entity that turns off or on communications. Uh, obviously there are also gatekeeping. There's gatekeeping in some aspects, for example, on the internet service provider level, but through proxying, you can always evade that. Through VPNs, you can evade that. So in other words, there's always multiple routes routes to different nodes on the internet. 
that's what makes email a very reliable peer-to-peer -peer method of communication. You can also think of the torrent protocol in which peer-to-peer -peer file sharing can happen. And as you can imagine, I mean, this had resulted in a lot of copyright claims uh, that uh, made big fuss for many of uh, these uh, corporates, corporations and conglomerates that had been relying on selling uh, their copyrighted material because they realized that this is leaking. And any minute you open up any of those uh, uTorrent websites or even apps like Streamio, you can tell that they have failed. They cannot control the data any longer because it flows directly from peer to peer. And you cannot really stop peer to peer exchange. It's similar to the trying to stop the two people in the street from communicating. And so if people find a way to share information, people find a way to share data, can they find a way to share value? And so that's the transition I will take you to next. And that's the idea behind Bitcoin. Bitcoin came as um, an, an illustration of what if the internet itself can allow exchange of value, just like it does allow exchange of information. And this, as I uh, reflected upon earlier, uh, there were many people who dismissed this technology at the time. And this is a, a, a nice graph that I often show, showing people dismiss Bitcoin and keeps rising again, which is basically the first cryptocurrency and crypt first implementer of blockchain. And the more you uh, try to attack it, the more uh, you realize that it is resistant to control and to uh, attacks. And the reason for that is that it's trying to build, uh, it's built around the internet, which in itself is uh, somewhat um, difficult to destroy. So let's look into the internet and I'll explain, go back uh, then to the analogy with information and value. So the internet, uh, the blockchain was built uh, through the Bitcoin uh, project, which is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system through this uh, scientific paper produced by Satoshi Nakamoto, whom many uh, still are arguing who that person is. Some say it might be a group, some say it's the CIA, some say it's the, uh, a person who's uh, still alive and not revealed. There are many different theories, but the idea is that the person it's himself or or the entity is not known, but the idea now is very well recognized. And the idea was to develop a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And so what that meant is that if you are able to communicate or transfer information, what if you are able to transfer value? And meaning the, the major difference between transferring value and information is that if you transfer cash from one side to the other, you should never be able to use it anymore. Unlike the case with the emails, you always have a copy of your email. But in this way, you actually need to, as if you are physically transferring something similar to the regular post. When you send them a letter or send a package, you actually do transmit it. It disappears at your end. So how can one do that? And that's why the idea behind Bitcoin emerged as a, a solution. So you see here, it's possible to use it for digital cash, but you can also use it for transferring authority over a particular piece of art, for example, or authority over a particular uh, certificate, digital certificate, for example. And that might bring us back to the notion of non-fungible tokens, NFTs, that could be also be considered a form of uh, value that's being transferred. So in this way, if you transfer something over the blockchain, you should be able to guarantee that the person who transferred it lost it. It no longer is in their possession. So let us see how this is uh, implemented in reality. So in a blockchain, you actually need to think of it as a way to eliminate the centralized accounting firm that is, or the ledger firm that is controlling transactions. In a regular transfer of value in, in today's traditional system, you have a bank keeping a ledger and the ledger has all the accounts of the different individuals that are connected to this bank. So if you have A sending to B here, so A will come over to the bank, ask them to, okay, take away some $100 from my account and give it to B. And so the bank agrees. And so it verifies that the owner has enough money 
and verifies the other client can accept the money. And so they issue in the ledger that the transaction happened. And now A has $100 less and B has $100 more. And this is established on the ledger. And the ledger is kept permanently in this centralized entity. So this is the regular banking system. On a, in a blockchain environment where you actually want to apply decentralization, you establish a mechanism where every single individual that signs up to the network has uh, an exact same syn uh, synchronized ledger. So this synchronized ledger is what is called the blockchain, meaning that the data here is existent all over the network. So what happens now is a person wants to send someone else. So there needs to be a way to verify if that person has that money. So on the ledger, it's recorded, for example, that A here has that uh, has $200, let's say. And so this is already recorded at the ledger. And this matches all over the ledger. And everyone on, on the blockchain has the exact copy of the information confirming that this person has enough money. So whenever a person would like to send to another person, there needs to be a way to control whether the other person has the capacity to receive it, this person has uh, the sufficient funds, and they confirm also and verify that the transaction has happened, and then that this person has $100 less, and this person has $100 plus. And so this very transaction needs to be verified across the blockchain. And in this way, every single transaction that happens exists on the blockchain that is distributed across the members. So if one node dies out, is eliminated for whatever reason, the blockchain continues to operate, no problem. And so in that way, we can guarantee that the de decentralized system can accept uh, can allow uh, uh, transactions to take place, provided that everything uh, is in the right order, the person has the, the funds, and the other person can accept the funds. And so this is the idea. How to do it? This is through mining, and I'll get to uh, that later. But let me go back to the uh, reason why this is the case. If you think of banks, if a bank decides to seize your money, if a bank decides to close down and announce bankruptcy, then your money is gone with it. And I remember many people have suffered from that. Similarly, if a central authority like a, um, a central bank decides to uh, create inflation, for example, and then this uh, value that you're putting into the, your bank account gets uh, a much lower uh, value over time, and so you lose. You lose more money because of certain controls by a central authority. And so the very notion of the blockchain, uh, the Bitcoin protocol was to combat that by resisting this centralization and ensuring that individuals are as, individ as independent entities from the centralized authority are the ones who uh, have the power to decide when and how they use their money. So in other words, it moves authority from the center to the periphery, to the individuals. And if you notice the first ever uh, transaction that took place embedded into it a comment. And this comment was basically the title of an, the Times article talking about the chancellor on brink of uh, second bailout uh, for banks. And this article itself uh, is now both documented inside the Bitcoin protocol but also documented as a reason or maybe a factor behind moving from these central authorities into a system that is not dependent on any central authority and it's not dependent on banks or on uh, financial systems. And so these are examples of how decentralization can happen. So the first one is uh, this, uh, that is how the internet is run. This is a regular bank. And this is the internet. So the internet is not fully de, uh, distributed, it's decentralized. And this is a distributed network that is basically a Bitcoin blockchain. So a Bitcoin blockchain requires the ledger to be existent on every single node. And so in that way, if you have a node on the blockchain, you have a copy of the ledger. And that is one reason why it, it's a, a matter of uh, space that you need to ensure 
that you have enough space to store all the transactions of everything. Walid, uh, I have a, a question. If you go ah, uh, back a slide, please. Okay, sure. So uh, uh, you, you mean the one about the, the uh, networks? Yes, uh, I, I, I was wondering, uh, when, when you talk about blockchain and Bitcoin, are there different types of blockchains and Bitcoins, or is it just one network that aggregates all the information and then it distributes it through the nodes? Uh, good question. Basically, I'm talking now about the concept of blockchain from the perspective of Bitcoin as the first blockchain. So it's like you have the idea of it being one single um, Bitcoin blockchain. So if you take it as Bitcoin being the first permissionless or public uh, blockchain, then this all applies to it. But the minute that you begin to introduce other types of technologies that are called distributed ledger technologies, then that is different, that you're moving away from the novel concept of the blockchain. And in fact, uh, as maybe later on, we'll go into that more, there will always be people who say blockchain good, Bitcoin bad. But that's not necessarily true in, in many ways. I mean, you can look into it from different perspectives. But the idea behind it is that Bitcoin was more or less the baseline, the place where blockchain technology started. So if you are going to uh, have a new technology that replaces it, I don't know what you can call it, but it's not the same as the uh, blockchain that was established by Bitcoin. So this, so far, we're just talking about Bitcoin and the Bitcoin's blockchain as a concept. But there are other blockchains, as I explained, I mean, other technologies that are in, it adapted uh, uh, some sort of uh, moved and evolved um, with different variations of how the uh, blockchain technology uh, occurs to them. And uh, some of them are more uh, towards, for example, uh, anon anonymization or privacy. Others are more towards uh, um, saving energy using a mechanism that is different than mining. Uh, through uh, proof of um, stake. But I'll go get into that later as well. I can see that there are several comments uh, going around, but- Eduardo has a question, can... Walid. I, yes. I, do, I do have a question. This is Eduardo. Uh, this, is, this, is, this picture here is the one, one that I always find uh, confusing with the terminology because you're talking about blockchain and Bitcoin, yeah. you know, this decentralization of, of, of you know, yeah. value or sending value. And then you, you exactly. show this picture and the one in the center is decentralized. Exactly. Uh, and here, here you're talking about the network. And, yeah, exactly. And, and then I say, well, 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 you know, the confusion is, but well, he's talking about decentralized there, but he's talking about decentralized here. No, he's talking about distributed. So then is mm -hmm. it blockchain a distributed? Uh, no, it's a decentralized of the value, but it's, uh, it's under a distributed network. Uh, so, if, if I look at the internet, the internet is C in this picture, right? It's, it's a distributed. No, I mean, it's, it's a decentralized. The decentralized internet is, is B. It's B. And C? Is... C is the full node blockchain. Okay. It is, it is the blockchain at its original raw, raw dimension that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto thought of. Okay. Okay. So it takes yeah. decentralization to the extreme. Okay. Or to see, speak. Um, however, uh, this, as I can explain later, has some limitations. And so it is uh, over time, it will probably move to this to become decentralized. The reason for uh, this being the ideal case is that if you have, if, if every single individual on the blockchain has a full list of uh, transactions so they don't need to rely on anyone else in order to check if any transaction is true or not is is verified or not so this is like more more or less as the ideal case and so this is the medium let's say between this totally centralized and uh, decentralized but right now we are talking about the ideal case and this is what the uh, bitcoin vision started as the distributed network where everyone has a copy of the ledger, okay? So uh, here is what explains, this is a video that explains how uh, the uh, blockchain mining process works. And this is basically a very uh, much uh, uh, time demanding process. I don't remember, 
I did a workshop, two hour long workshop, simply to explain this, which is how does mining work? And so I would rather skip this and uh, afford that you shall check the video out on your own. It's a, uh, the uh, World Economic Forum video. That is a very uh, creative uh, way of explaining it through examples, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, yeah, so mining, the mining process now is purely built around proof of work, meaning that you have to generate enough electricity to be able to mine blocks on the blockchain in the Bitcoin case. And that means more energy use uh, to guarantee that only those who have enough power can be the ones who mine. And this is, if you read to the literature around Bitcoin, is a, a guarantee, uh, some sort of assurance that it would not be abused or taken over. But we can go uh, through that more into later into the questions. But let us think of the what the Bitcoin characteristics are. And so the first thing is scarcity. Only 21 million Bitcoins can ever be produced. And we've now exceeded 16 million. So there's an only a few more to be produced, a few million more. It's durable because it cannot degrade over time, unlike paper money. And it's portable, obviously, through the internet. It's divisible. You have uh, trillions of, I don't know the figure, but trillions of satoshis, which is the subunits of the Bitcoin that you can divide to. Its authentic, uh, authenticity is always verifiable. You can know every single transaction's history. You can go back and, and trace. And it is storable, obviously, on hard disks. It is fungible, meaning that it is possible to divide by units, and every unit is exactly the same as every other unit. For example, Satoshi is a, is a Satoshi, and Bitcoin is a Bitcoin, regardless of who sends it. It's counterfeit resistance because of this, because authenticity is verifiable. You can know if there's a fake, uh, I mean, uh, if, if you get an email saying, okay, I'll send you Bitcoins and you can check this address, then you can look into the address and see if the address has no Bitcoin, for example, even uh, over a third party uh, platform. And it's widely usable. As of today, of course, you may imagine that it uh, has so much use around the world. And it arguably makes Bitcoin perhaps the first global virtual cash. And maybe some of you are already, uh, I may have heard of the E1, electronic one, the Chinese digital uh, currency, which is a central bank issued currency. But the idea here is that no, there's no global cash that exists wide, more widely than the Bitcoin. Maybe the E1 would try to do, replicate the success of Bitcoin, who knows? And, and you can tell over time, it has really risen from a fraction of um, a cent to already over $35,000 over in two, 12 years. I know there's a lot of fluctuation, uh, but this is natural in a supply and demand market. And there's no guarantees. It would always be uh, above a certain bigger. It depends on who's willing to buy. But there uh, are reasons for people buying and it's because of scarcity, because they think that is resilient and robust. Uh, yes, a question? Yes, Walid. Uh, uh... Eduardo is asking, uh, and it's uh, an interesting uh, question. When when one does a transaction, uh, how long does it take uh, before it shows in in the ledger? And does the 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 amount vary? I mean, the cost. Uh, since you're talking about five cents to 35,000, 35, from the time I initiate the transaction till it till the point it re reflects on the ledger, is there a, a change in, in the amount or does it stay based on the market price? Thank you. That's a good point. Thank you for that. I mean, so there are two things. Uh, this question is a combined question. The first question, how long does it take for a ledger to a transaction to be confirmed? Because you send out your transaction request, there's something called a mempool or memory pool where there are many, many different uh, transactions. And then in your own transaction, you actually propose a fee. And so the fee itself is very solid reason or a factor of how fast your transaction will be picked up. Because of the way that blocks are created, miners take transactions that have higher fees. And so if your fee is high enough, it would take a, a fraction of a minute 
perhaps. If it's if it's uh, not average, it may take up to ten minutes. It's depending dependent on how much fees you put into it. The other thing is that it also depends on the uh, volume of uh, mining and transactions that are taking place. Because if you have too many transactions, it's going to be too competitive, and you'd have to raise your fee even higher. And that's problematic for in cases where you have uh, intense competition. Uh, I'll give you an example that happened in Ethereum, which is the second biggest blockchain. There were times that the fees were astronomical. And it, this is in, in Ethereum uh, terms, it's called gas fee. And so they ended up having to spend more money sometimes. It, sometimes it, if you are uh, going to transact through Ethereum for $100, you might actually have to pay $50 to, as a fee. So I'm just give you an, giving you an example. If you'd like to get the, the transaction fast enough and over to the next, and you may end up not having it go through at all. So there are fundamental flaws in this logic, I can, as you can imagine. The idea here is that someone needs to uh, get paid, right? And the miners prefer to use fees as a very solid way. If you have too many, many, many different transactions, then you would get the top, the most, let's say, uh, the highest fees to get it across. So it depends on the fee, and that's what uh, dictates the speed. As for the other uh, question, which is about the, car, the price, this has nothing to do with the protocol. Prices are something that the market dynamics, the Bitcoin market dynamics play out, uh, the exchange, uh, let's say, uh, services such as Binance or, or uh, uh, others, BitMEX. These sorts of services are a supply and demand platform. So. Someone says, okay, this is the, what the Bitcoin price is worth. And so if there is agreement, people will you know, sell with that price. If people don't buy, and so the price would have to go down. And so it's a typical market that has nothing to do with the technology per se. So it doesn't mean that your Bitcoins don't come across. The transaction has nothing to do with the actual price. So whenever you actually... Um, send a Bitcoin and a person gets a Bitcoin from one side to the other, the minute that you pay uh, or start the transaction, the, the person at the very end will get a Bitcoin. If you send a Bitcoin, it will be a Bitcoin. It's the exact same unit. The only problem happens when you begin to think of it in terms of exchange for another currency, such as USD or euros, in which case uh, that is a bargain between you and the person who is willing to sell you. The Bitcoin. And that's where decentralized and sometimes also decentralized exchanges uh, play a role. They are the ones who really are in control of prices. So they are totally different to uh, things. So Walid, uh, sorry. Yeah, it, it answers. Uh, I, I do have another question and I'm going to uh, give you this scenario. When, when ransomware happens, when a hacker you know, uh, blocks a, a, a website and asks for a, an amount of money and the transaction has to be in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. When I initiate the transaction to pay for the ransomware to get my website back, do I also have to pay the fees? And does the, the person that is requesting the money immediately sees the transaction being initiated and finished? Yes, so the fees would have to be issued uh, to get the transaction mined, because if you don't have a fee, you won't have a transaction. So the minute, I mean, he wouldn't care if you pay a high fee or a small fee, he just needs his net amount, which is after the fee is paid. And so uh, he wouldn't accept, for example, if you say, I've sent it to the mempool and I issued the transaction, he will have to wait until it is verified, in which case it has been now embedded into a block that has become part of the blockchain. Until then, uh, your transaction is out there in the open. It's still not verified. And so that's one reason why um, there are some blockchains that have a way to revoke a transaction. So calling it back, <laughs> if, if you send it to the mempool and it's not taken, then you call it back and then upgrade uh, or improve or raise the fee so that it gets uh, into a block. So I would say the ransomware guy or whoever is getting your money will actually have to wait 
until it is verified and already now accepted. And there are cases where even a verified transaction with one block, uh, uh, one block already after the verified block, sometimes that itself ends up being what is called an orphan block, meaning that it doesn't really continue on. And then a better, a uh, longer branch of the blockchain uh, continues. And so that's why some uh, would actually tell you that we need to wait for five verifications, meaning five blocks already built on top of the block that you have your transaction in. And so that means longer times sometimes. And so uh, it depends on the person's uh, determination to get his or her money, then you would have uh, to think of it that they will probably wait uh, a bit longer in, to ensure that their money uh, is uh, sent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And so that explains why this caricature, for example, this is a meme says, okay, you will have to pay in Bitcoin. <laughs> That's in 2025. I don't think that will happen then, but it's just one of those ideas that have been floating that people will begin to use Satoshis or uh, Bitcoins for transactions. Whether it happens or not, it's, it's up, to, up in the air. Let's move now to the uh, case use cases. And so some, some blockchains would actually have higher transaction fees, some others have lower transaction fees, but the idea behind it is that uh, Bitcoin um, itself has a transaction fee that's much lower than actual uh, money remittances. Um, uh, there were many news items in the past, I don't know if you remember, but there were cases where you have uh, billions of US dollars sent from one side of the internet to the other, uh, and the fee was a fraction of a dollar. I mean, it is something incomprehensible for many people. How can you send a billion US dollars for one cent? I mean, this is not possible. How does it work? That's because Bitcoin transactions don't, don't depend on the amount being sent. I mean, Bitcoin fees don't depend on the amount being sent. It's not a percentage, unlike Western Union or so, so on. And so uh, it means that it's going to be an incentive for people to use these sorts of uh, transactions to send large sums of money across the globe. That's one thing. And then you also have uh, uh, the ability to program and many, uh, say, code transactions. So you can have what is called colored coins and time stamping. There could be added embedded code into the transaction itself. So for example, one idea would be using a multi-sig uh, transaction. A multi-sig is similar to a way that if you've ever thought, saw the Hollywood movies where you have a massive, let's say, uh, treasure uh, case uh, at the bank that needs two keys, and you need to have two individuals having holding the two keys and turning it exactly at the same time. So that's actually uh, programmable into blockchain. And so you can have a wallet that you'd only be possible to access the content of it if you have two individuals uh, signing it together, signing the transaction so it can be released. So it can be also used for programming escrows, a third party. You can do micro payment channels. Uh, you can do side chains and lightning networks. This is a very interesting um, domain of development in Bitcoin. Because if you remember, there was the distributed network where you had every single transaction having to be stored and every single, uh, let's say, node. And that means that you would have billions of transactions stored at every single computer. So the Lightning Network is trying to emulate the internet by saying that, okay, instead of having every single person, regardless of how you know, uh, active they are on the blockchain to have a copy instead of doing it, let's take individual uh, nodes and build on top of them uh, smaller, lighter nodes where they can actually transact via a gatekeeper. So the gatekeeper will be a regional nodes. And then on top of that, there will be a few that have no uh, copies of the ledger. And so that's the idea behind Lightning Network. It's rather advanced, but its uh, pr promise is to lower fees and make transactions instant. And so that they can compete with Visa and MasterCard in this case. But I would recommend that you check them out. They're an interesting um, proposal. So you can also do that for tracking payments, progress, crowdfunding. You can use it for e-voting because a transaction for value can also be a vote. If you do it once, then it's it. 
you can't do it again. It's like uh, sending, you have $1 given to every single person, that dollar will be sent to someone. So it's the same analogy here is that you, value can be a vote, a vote, can be an intellectual property, can be an identification. So all of these can be seen in the, in the uh, theory around blockchain. And you can also use that for real estate, verifying real estate, uh, transfer of ownership, et cetera. And now we you also have the world of decentralized finance and uh, non-fungible tokens. And if anyone has a, a question on that, this is where uh, I can answer. Um, I can, I don't see it. Is, the, is that question the, the same that you had earlier, uh, Eduardo, or? Okay. All right, so uh, let's see if there are new questions in the meantime. So we talk about decentralization, but what about the one that owns the organization that allows the blockchain to work? It's not that kind of centralization I'm making. Okay, so that's a good question. It's always important to be critical in this case. So by saying organization that allows the blockchain to operate, do you mean the miners? Because miners are mining grids, are big corporations that have a lot of processing power and they are the ones competing for accessing the fees, for example, and being able to be paid for mining. If that is the case, then uh, yes, there were times when there was a centralization of mining in, in China, for example. There were so many different companies. I think China for one time once had the majority of mining power. So had you actually thought of it in that sense, then miners would be possibly possible to control had they not actually signed up for to the source code of Bitcoin. The source code of Bitcoin is something that you can't change any longer because it's established, it's in the protocols of everyone. So the best thing you can do is simply try to destroy these mines or try to eliminate these miners altogether. Not being able to control the source code means that all you're doing is trying to increase your share of mining power, but not manipulating the uh, blockchain as a whole. And also uh, there is this, what is called the 51% attack. Uh, there are theories that if you have enough power, enough, uh, let's say uh, leverage over uh, miners, you can manipulate the mining power so that it, it succeeds in distorting or choosing selecting particular set of transactions. Well, that defeats the purpose of the, the blockchain. A blockchain in the terms of uh, Bitcoin is meant to reward those who work harder. And so it's not going to be for controlling power or controlling uh, transactions. So it's antithetical to the concept of uh, blockchain and Bitcoin. It might, I mean, I can't rule out that there would be some conspiracy or government that will take over control of all the machines where these blockchain mining, uh, uh, say, uh, protocols or, say, codes are being run. But the cost for that is astronomical. The cost for that is beyond you know, comprehension. You have to have trillions of dollars to spend. And no government so far has been really willing to go that far. All they are doing now is blocking mining. Uh, forbidding miners, uh, forbidding Bitcoin, which has happened in, in China. And all these big mining factories or let's say industries in China have moved elsewhere. And so now, uh, yes, at the beginning, there was a bit of a, a, a slope in terms of Bitcoin price and hash rate and, and the rate in which you mine. But very slowly after that, it recovered. And now the world is continuing to mine Bitcoin as if nothing happened without China with them. So that explains why it is very difficult to control this realm. All right, so um, no one has a question on NFTs, I'm glad. But let's take into uh, consideration the three characteristics that make blockchain interesting or uh, different than everything else in the past. Uh, one is that it's distributed, meaning that it exists uh, across different nodes. The next, this means that you don't need to trust an individual uh, central authority. The next thing is that everything is recorded and everything is transparent and open, meaning that every single transaction is on an open ledger. So you can go over and verify the information. The third is that since this is distributed and open, it's immutable. It cannot change what happened in the past. 
And it's, uh, remi it reminds me very much of how uh, regular accounting works. If you have an accounting firm and you'd like them to uh, re reverse a transaction, or uh, let's say um, they, you've sent money to the wrong person, so now you need to actually get that money back. You simply cannot go to the accountant and ask them, all right, please remove what happened in the past. It's already in the past. It's, you're simply recording what happened. You can't go back in time. And so in this case, you simply reverse it by uh, having a new transaction. And that's the exact way blockchain would work, like any financial system, proper financial system. And that's why it's much more secure than any centralized system. And so why is this only, uh, um, it's, it started in FinTech, but is it only in FinTech that can, it can operate um, and provide value? Apparently not. And this is an article that I've co-written with uh, Nicholas uh, Stadler, also with the Internet Society at the time. And the idea behind it is to explore what other aspects, what other potentials can the, inter the blockchain have beyond currency, beyond money. And so it makes a sense now to think of it as if you think of value being on different levels and different, you can have value being a spectrum of things or a variety of things. In this case, there are values and things that are not only money, uh, sometimes credibility, reputation, intellectual property, all of these are also values. Um, I see new questions. Let me go through them in case uh, we have blockchain. There's no, yep, so that's, set. Yeah, Satish has correctly you know, answered that question. And so uh, use dollars regularly. How can I exchange dollars for Bitcoin? And all right, you can always go to an exchange. There are different types of exchanges. Some of them are decentralized. So just write uh, Google uh, Bitcoin exchange and you'll get a list of the most popular exchanges. For example, Binance is the largest by far. And there you have a way to simply um, load uh, euros or dollars. And from there you can change that to any cryptocurrency, but be, be aware that be aware that all uh, centralized exchanges uh, are uh, in control of your money. So it's similar to having a bank. Until you move the cryptocurrency back to your own wallet and in a hard wallet or a soft wallet on your own device, so you use the uh, central these centralized exchanges for uh, transacting, and then once you have the cryptos, you move them all the way to your own wallet. And so um, what are the use cases that are the, we have explored? One of them is called fighting information, disinformation. And we've taken this from the perspective of disinformation as actually uh, possible to tackle through two measures. First, if we can verify information that is original, and that's using the blockchain's ability to trace, and uh, provenance. And then you actually have the way uh, mutability being something that you can also use, because in this case, you can uh, make sure that whatever genuine material you have uh, that is not, you know, doctored or manipulated is uh, securely archived. And then you, you have the ability to keep it dis distributed, in which case this information is open and public and accessible to everyone. So it's like saying, this is the truth. This is the true reality of what happened. It's stored here. Let's say an incident happened and a picture is there. This is the original picture. And this picture exists on the blockchain in the form of a hashed, uh, a hash code of that particular content. And that's how you can guarantee that this content is in fact genuine. And in that way, we thought this would be a useful case study to look into. And we looked into uh, possible ideas in which uh, one can work with, and we found this project called Trupic. I recommend you check it out. Trupic is an application that uses blockchain to store real images. Uh, they simply, you simply take a, pot, a photo, upload it to the blockchain, and then once it's in the blockchain, it becomes uh, referenced through the app. And anytime a person would like to verify if that, if that particular um, information, video or photo is genuine or not, all you need to do is take the hash for, of that particular uh, multimedia content, compare it with what exists on the blockchain, which have, has been generated some time back. And then with that, in that way, you can verify without needing to upload the whole picture, but you create a hash. And uh, 
it's difficult to explain what a hash is, but uh, you can look into uh, definitions of what it is. It's just one very uh, clever way in which you can convert a particular uh, content into a code in which you can refer to it later uh, in an authentic way. There's a question saying, what assurances do I have and from whom that I will be able to convert Bitcoins to some other currency in the future? All right, so that's a good question. I, I don't think there are any guarantees. <laughs> You're betting on the scarcity of Bitcoins and the fact that you have evidence that proves your owner, you're the owner of it. But in, um, in the, there is little doubt in my opinion that uh, there will be risk that you won't be able to find someone to buy your Bitcoins later. Uh, the, the biggest risk is not that it, you will not be able to sell it later, sorry. The, the risk is that you lose your code and you lose your uh, cryptographic key, uh, private key, in which case uh, everything is lost. Your money is lost forever. So if you, the only thing I would recommend is that if you get the hard wallet, make sure that you have a copy of your private key. And there's a lot of uh, advice online on how to do that. So that was true pick. And uh, the idea of blockchain being a way to store information that is critical about, uh, let's say, uh, particular events happening, etc., has now been embraced by the New York Times by the BBC and, and uh, Radio Canada and others, where they put into practice the ideas of generating authentic data and storing it on the blockchain. And so these are two projects that are still ongoing. They are not yet there because of the reasons I mentioned earlier. The internet went through many, many different stages until it has become you know, uh, adopted by the masses, but uh, Bitcoin is still far behind. And so you can always use uh, Bitcoin uh, as, as a way for you to uh, verify authenticity, even in cases where you have Chinese authorities being involved. This is a Chinese Supreme Court that said, we actually allow to rule based on internet evidence, based on blockchain evidence. And this is uh, un unprecedented in such a large and high scale. But they found that the technology is a way for them to guarantee that something has stayed fixed during this period. And that's why uh, it is, if China can see this as uh, proof that it works, there is really no reason why other countries won't embrace this and use it as a way to validate information. And there are also some companies like Bernstein that uses this on a legal capacity. And that is being accepted in multiple countries as well. So that's another way in which you can actually see to it that there is increasing evidence pointing to this. And so there are also media uh, developments in this field where people can track how transactions evolved over time, such as the pizza. I don't know if you recall, there was once a pizza uh, deal where 10,000 Bitcoins were sent out for, to a pizza company. Uh, and a store or restaurant, and then they got the pizza with it. That was in 2010. Imagine how much 10,000 Bitcoins would be worth today. That would be um, well all around 1,000, it's already 30,300 million plus. Yeah, so that's a lot of money. And also not to forget that this information is possible to tra track. You actually can know today where the transactions of these individuals went and who got the Bitcoins after this long time. Yeah, already 350. <laughs> That's in Canadian. And so uh, you, what you need to know about is that there is also this Web3 you know, discussion. If the blockchain can be, serve, can be helpful in distributing data, Instead of storing it on certain servers, you have it all over the internet, all over the web in a secure fashion. This is still a lot of bluff more than it is a real uh, action because of many reasons, including the uh, scalability of blockchain. It's still not scalable. But these are some ideas that are being circulated on the use of uh, Web 3.0. And so there was a study that we did for a book called Blockchain and Web 3.0. Here at the university, uh, my colleague who, who sits just across the corridor, Malin, we put this study together and then we analyzed a particular project called Civil, 
And we, we came to see how difficult it was for them to adapt. It was like curve fitting something that is to, to do with FinTech into the journalism world. And you can tell here from this flow chart is that it had a lot of conditions, a lot of these uh, steps that would have been taken to achieve what they achieved. The problem with all of this is that it was just too complex and people didn't really appreciate how much uh, investment, let's say how uh, transformative this could be. And so over time, uh, this resulted in a few relative advantages, not something totally uh, revolutionary. And this is how uh, the Rogers theory around diffusion of innovations explains how technologies evolve from one stage to the next. And so if you are to achieve the same level of disruption that the internet achieved, you need to meet five based on the, this theory, five things, advantage, compatibility, complexity that is reasonable and also possible to explain, trialability, it has been tried and, and used and it can be observed. And we have unfortunately not yet passed to, based on this theory, passed what is called the chasm where you move from the early innovators to the major, early majority. And so uh, we are still stuck in this area for the blockchain. We have not yet moved there. There's a lot of hype. There's a lot of misinformation, confusion. Until we move to the early majority, we are going to still uh, try and, and, and innovate and reach what we, what we can. We only found in our study, in your, our use case, that the uh, blockchain technology allows a marginal improvement in a relative innovation, uh, a relative advantage in improving trust. That's all it can do so far, but every other aspect of the technology didn't work. And so that's why before the project collapsed, we did send warning signs to the team. And I, in fact, I shared the critique we had in the article with the civil team. And uh, unfortunately, it was also uh, not enough in terms of testing, there was not much testing in the technology. Uh, it, uh, it did not really create the uh, power uh, dynamics and change in power dynamics. And uh, it still needed a lot of work in terms of development because the use of this needs to be embraced by the traditional media and it's not enough. So we need to have ensure that users using the technology are going to impact traditional media. But there is a lot of issues with it. And that's why, unfortunately, uh, rest in peace, the civil project collapsed. And that's just a good example of where we can, as humans, uh, try, a trial and error is always good, but there are reasons for certain things collapsing. We also did a project at the university here in terms of developing our own uh, protocol using the Hyperledger system. It was a, funding, a, fu a project funded by Vinova a Swedish agency for development. And these are the conclusions we arrived to. It was too complex and it's still in steady development because even the Hyperledger folks at the Hyperledger Foundation did not really uh, have a stable version. They kept on having to change a lot of things and from version two to version three, much has changed. And so we had to reprogram a lot of things. And there are also issues with immutability because this was a per private permissioned blockchain that we tried to work on. And it was also extremely expensive and it didn't really lead to uh, the scalability that would have been required to move from a few companies that we worked with into thousands of companies. So it, it was a research worth doing, but it, it actually showed us that there's a lot to work with still in terms of blockchain. And so that's all from my side. Um, if you are interested in looking into this, basically from the research dimension, not to get rich 